So unit four, so this is just going to be integration. The only thing that was from unit two was that polar and parametric differentiation. The rest of it's pretty much integration here on out. We do a little bit of stuff with derivatives though in unit six, but it's not like a derivative unit. But anyway, integration, it's all about antiderivatives. The main goal of calculus with integration was to find the area of any shape, not just squares, circles, rectangles, but what about some weird, weirdly shaped object. Now, why is this important? Because whenever we want machines to make things, just think 3D printers, that sort of thing, you need to, you know, code them and the only computers only understand math. So to be able to make some weirdly shaped object, you have to explain it with math. And that's the whole importance of this. I'm assuming that's why engineers have to take this class, but I really don't know. But um, area of a plane, so it's the area of any shape, including non-basic shapes like this one. But today we're going to be working on stuff that what about, what about a shape like this? Okay, so this intersects at zero here, but what if I wanted to find the area from zero to infinity here? Okay, so this, this graph right here is getting infinitesimally closer down here. Does that mean there's in, it's getting infinitesimally closer, but it's also getting infinitesimally longer, like the width of it is getting further and further out there. Does that mean that there's an infinite area? Does it converge to an area? We don't know. That's, I mean, maybe somebody knows, but we're gonna be going over that today. Um, what about a graph that looks like this? Okay, now we have, um, say we're finding the area from this value right here to this value right here. Is it infinity because it goes up forever, but they're both getting infinitesimally closer. I don't know, we're gonna have to figure that out as well. And then we have this one right here where now it goes infinitely up, but infinitely closer to the Y axis. And then the same thing only with the X axis. It's going infinitely to the right, but getting infinitesimally closer to that X axis. Does that have an infinite area or does that converge on a value? So that's kind of the main idea for today. But before we go over that, I want to review Riemann sums. You do not need to write this down. You should know this from Calc 1. Riemann sums is basically the, the geometric way of thinking about integration uh, and, until we go to infinity, which, we, which would use limits. That's the calculus part. So Riemann, Riemann sums here. This first, um, these, just look at these three pictures right here. You're basically... I, I'm trying to find the area underneath this curve right here, but I'm trying to do it by approximating with rectangles. So you can draw rectangles underneath here to kind of approximate. And if you notice this first one represents one rectangle, although it has no height, so it's just a line. And it's, it's bounded by the left upper corner of the rectangle. So if you can see the rectangle goes up and stops right away because it knocks into that graph. Okay, it's not very exciting. The area of zero here, obviously the area isn't gonna be zero because you can see that it's greater than zero, it's this positive value here. So let's look at this next one. Now we have two rectangles, even though this is still just a line, but you have a rectangle here and a rectangle here. If you notice, it's filling in more of this area here. Here it was filling in none of it, but it's filling in more of it, so it's a better approximation. Then if you use four rectangles, this third one right here, if you use four of them, you're, you're filling in even more of that empty space. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, so as you can see, the, the approximation is getting closer and closer to the area underneath. So theoretically, how many rectangles do you need to get the exact area? Does anybody remember this? Infinite. Right? Infinitely many. Okay. And then also, what is the width of those infinitely many rectangles? If you notice, the width here is two. The width here is one. The width here is uh, one half for each of these. What's the width of all those rectangles if there's infinitely many? Should reach to zero, right? Yeah, it's approaching zero, exactly. So as, if, you, if you have infinitely many rectangles, they have to be infinitely thin to fill in the area completely. Otherwise, it's gonna be off by a little bit, okay? This is left Riemann sums. You're never gonna need to do this for this class, but it should be a review from previous content. Okay, here, we have one where it's bounded by the right upper corner. So if you see right here, we have a rectangle, but it's bounded by the top. So it, it goes, it goes, the rectangle goes up until the upper right corner hits the graph. So we have one rectangle here. Here we have two. You notice the upper right of each of these rectangles, it stops. Here we have four. If you notice, these are going to be overestimates, but it's getting, it's the same principle comes into play where the more and more rectangles you use, the more and more exact your area is. Okay. So these are going to get you the same answer if you use infinitely many. There's another thing that you had to learn before was midpoints. Now you're doing the rectangle that's bounded by the middle of the rectangle up until the graph. So if you see this first one here, it stops in the middle. This one stops in the middle here, and then this one stops in the middle, and then all four stop in the middle here. This is the midpoint Riemann sum. This is even more exact. If you notice, there's less space, but there's also a little bit of an overestimate here too, so it's kind of actually hard to tell that one. Okay, and then the last one you should have learned about was the trapezoid rule, where if you add more and more trapezoids, it starts filling in the space more and more. Now, if you notice, this is a tri triangle here, which is basically a, a trapezoid with one of the base lengths to be zero. Is I mean, you can think of it that way as a triangle. But as long as you, if you can see that if you add more and more 
of the trapezoids, it fills more and more of the area in. Again, infinitely many, yielding the exact area. Okay, I made some graphs. I mean, that's how I did all these screenshots here, was I made a Desmos file that shows this, and I think this is pretty neat, but I'm very biased probably with this. All right, so we have that x squared from zero to two. So if you notice right here, it says x squared from A to B, zero to two. And I only have two rectangles here, okay? So what I can do is I can add more rectangles here and if you notice, it starts filling in more and more and more each time. You can still see the white space, but I'm going to fill it. I'm going to go right to 100. If you notice, it looks like it's filled in all the way, but you can zoom in here and see, up. Oh, there's more. So what I'm going to do here is add more rectangles. Okay, now it looks like it fills in more, but if you zoom in, uh-oh, still see some more. Okay, I'm going to do it again. Up, oh, still see some more. Okay, and you can just keep doing that. Eventually, if you zoom in enough, and if Desmos didn't run out of memory, you'll see that it's still off by a little bit, okay? But it's a pretty good estimate for what we're doing. Okay, so what, hold on one second, let's do this. Okay, so let me zoom out real quick. I do have, we're, we are comparing this to the exact. The exact area is found using definite integrals. This should be a review as well. I wrote it in right here, let me zoom in here. I wrote it in right here. So the exact area, this thing right here, should be 2.6 repeating, okay? Now, you might go, why is it repeating? Why isn't it actually doing like the frag? You can make it a fraction here, but what, you're, what this computer is actually doing is just counting infinitesimally small things. I mean, it, it still has a, a finite value, but it is very, very, very tiny. But your, your, your computer's just rounding it off, basically. This computer's just rounding it off. Your calculator does the same thing. It's not actually doing the, the antiderivative and plugging things in. It's simply just counting, and the calculator can count faster than we can. Um, here is the, the, it's basically summing up the area of all of those rectangles here. And if you notice, this is an approximation, this 2.28 and this 2.6 repeating is the exact. But watch what happens if I increase the number of rectangles. So let's do 100 here. If you notice this 2.6268 gets closer to this 2.66. Now if I just overload this thing, you notice it starts getting even closer to this value. Okay, you don't need antiderivatives to do this. You just need to add up a bunch of rectangles. Now this would obviously take us a long time to a computer, it's absolutely nothing. Okay, the same thing happens if I change the C value, it goes to, I guess I should show the, let's do this. Let's do this. So if I change the C value to 0.5, it does the midpoint for all of these. If, again, you can see the same thing. It converges to that area underneath. And then if you do, the right-hand sum, it does the same thing, converges to all those values, okay? Also, if you notice right here, if you add more and more, it still gets closer to that exact area here. Okay, hopefully this is ringing some bells for people. I also made a trapezoid rule program, and if you notice, if you add more and more trapezoids, here, let's zoom in here, let's do no trapezoids, and then if you start adding one, two, three, four, you just keep adding them up, it's gonna fill it in exactly, to get the exact, I don't think I actually wrote that in here though. It's okay, it doesn't matter. All right, so that's trapezoidal and Riemann sums. That should be a quick review of that. Again, I'm not gonna actually ask you any of that, but uh, it does come in handy later on for the class. Uh, here is a, I'm, I coded this in Python, if anyone knows what the Python programming language is. And basically it finds the right sum, left sum, midpoint sum, and trapezoid sum based on the number of rectangles or, or trapezoids based down here. And I went to 100 again. And if you notice, they start really far away. And if you remember the exact, the exact value is 2.6 repeating, which is oddly where all of them converge. It's not odd, uh, that's meant to happen. If something um, is integrable, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but if, if it has an integral, then this will happen every single time. They will all converge. If it doesn't, then that means it probably goes to infinity or negative infinity, it diverges, it's not integrable. I feel like I'm saying that wrong, but that's okay. Um, so if you notice, they all go to the same value. So that's Riemann sums. Here is something that you've seen before, but basically if you if you add up infinitely many, that's this, this is adding up, this sum notation is adding up the length I'm sorry, the height times the base or length times the width, you can do it that way. If you add up infinitely many rectangles, you get the, the integral from A to B, the definite integral from A to B of the function. And you don't need to know any of this. Again, it just should be a little review 
for you. Is there any questions on Riemann sums? Okay, 432 is all about the fundamental theorem of calculus. We're not really going to go over this too much in this class. We mostly focus on the first fundamental theorem, which is what definite integrals are all about. If you do want to find the exact area, all you have to do is take the antiderivative, that's what this capital F is, plug in B, plug in A, and then subtract the two values. Okay, so if I was, if I was going to do that for the problem that I was just on, that I was just doing. So say I was doing the, and don't write this down. I just want your brains for right now. If I was gonna do this problem, what you would do is you would do the antiderivative. That's the antiderivative of that. And then we're integrating it from zero to two. So we're finding the area from zero to two, like I was just talking about a second ago. Okay, and then if you do that, you end up, you have to plug in two to this and you get eight. You plug in zero to this, you get zero. And you end up with eight thirds, which is that 2.6 repeating. If you notice, I didn't have to add all those things up like the computer did, okay? But it's the exact same principle, okay? One, is in, one involves adding things up, the other one just finds the exact by using the antiderivative, okay? Again, this should all be a review. Uh, here is a graph just to kind of review this stuff. You can't have negative area. So if I move this over right here, if you notice there's more red than blue, so I just program this to, to change color, basically. And if you notice, the area here is negative. It's the capital F of B minus capital F of A here, and it ends up being negative. If I added more positive here, now this becomes positive. Okay. You can go back this way. I don't know. It's pretty cool. That's the first fundamental theorem of calculus. You are going to need that. I'm going to need this later. You are going to need that for definite integrals. We're not going to cover the second fundamental theorem, if you remember that. Um, it's tons of fun, but we're not going to worry about that for this class. It's beyond the scope. Okay, definite integrals, again, is the same thing as the first fundamental theorem. So it's what I did here. This is definite integrals. You should know how to do that. We are going to, we are going to review today how to do that, but you should know ahead of time. The new things we're going to go over would be improper integrals. And these are things that involve limits going to infinity. So limits are needed for finding the, the infinitely many rectangles that are infinitely thin. But what if you use limits on the endpoints of the integral? So we had this, this is two right here. What if I got rid of this and put infinity, right? That means you would have to change this to probably B here. And then we're doing the limit as B goes to infinity. And then what do you end up getting? Well, you would end up with infinity, if you can see, because you, if you plug B in, B to the third, if B is going to infinity, you would have an infinite area if you went to infinity on this. It's not that exciting. If you went to the graph, you could see that yourself too. So if I did X squared, you could see if I did the area from zero to infinity, it's going to go to infinity. I mean, I'm not even going to infinity and look at how huge this number is here. Okay. So you can kind of get an idea of how that looks with improper. That would be one case of improper. Another case would be is if you have a vertical asymptote. So um, this infinitely many, it's usually deals with horizontal. This usually deals with, with, with vertical asymptotes. I'm going to show you an example of that later. Actually, I already showed you an example in the very beginning. Come on. This one right here. Okay. It's vertically going to infinity, even though horizontally it's not because I stopped at these points here. So... We're gonna deal, we're gonna do those problems today. Those are fun. And last thing we're gonna go over is the area of a polar region. So there's only really two things we're covering today. So the area of a polar region, you I can't actually make a decimos file out of this because it doesn't fill the area correctly. But you know polar regions are generally circular in nature. And you can see right here if we have this, it's not actually a circle, but you have this 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 curve right here, this polar curve. And if you just added up the slices of pizza, if you want to like break it down into pizza slices, if you add those up and you added them up infinitely, if you added infinitely many of them that are infinitely thin, you would get this formula right here. Okay. It's all based on area of a sector formula, which is one half R squared times theta for radians. Okay. Now, if you added up those areas, that was, that's what turns into an integral. So the area, the added up area, the total area, uh, would be equal to one half r squared d theta because it's the infinitely thin thetas. If you go back to this picture, infinitely thin thetas times one half r, which comes from the sector equation. If you do not like this explanation, I made a video that was way more in depth of where this equation comes from. It's on my website right here. If you scroll down, um, hopefully this is on mute. 
Nope, it's not. Ah, that's embarrassing. All right, but I actually go through the entire like breakdown of where everything comes from, and I draw a bunch of like slices of pizza and stuff like that and, and show where the equation comes from. I don't actually draw pizza. It just looks like a pizza. So if you're interested in where that equation comes from, it's there. But again, beyond the scope of the class, so you don't really need to know where this equation comes from. You are going to need to know how to use it, though. OK, so that's basically a sneak preview of everything we're going to cover today. If it's way over your head, hopefully you'll, it'll make more sense when we do a bunch of examples. And hopefully you start thinking about questions that you want to ask during this whole thing, because yeah, it's pretty involved. Um, next thing I want to do. So there's four things we're coming over the quiz, um, the quiz here, the quiz one. Uh, we already did that. The reviewing definite integrals, improper integrals, and area of a polar region. And then I also put two problems from the fake final on here so that we can go over those. Uh, so yeah, let's go over definite integrals really quick. Okay. Um, so what I would want you to do right now is take about two minutes and start number one. I will put a timer on and then once that's done, we will go over how to do that problem. Okay, the next step, we have about 20 seconds. You plug in two pi. And then you subtract off when you plug in pi. Okay, and that's time. Okay, does anybody want to help me out here? What's cosine of 2 pi? 1. So that ends up being negative 1, right? Very good. And then this ends up being plus cosine of pi, which is what? Negative. Negative 1. So your final answer should be negative 2. Did anyone else get that? Cool. All right, so what I'm going to do here is go back to this Desmos file I made. And we are going from pi to pi. So we're going to have to zoom in here. If you notice, it is negative. So we did get negative 2. And if you actually look at this graph right here, negative 2. OK, also, I'm going to show you how to do this on your calculator so you know how to check it. So pull your calculator out. You probably already know how to do this, but just in case you forgot, this definitely uh, helps. So we're going to clear all this out. Math 9 is your friend. Okay, so you're going to hit Math 9. I'm in Polar. I'm going to change that to be in Function really quick. There we go. Quit. All right, so Math 9. Okay, we're going from pi to 2 pi. And we're doing sine x with respect to x. Hit Enter. Then you open negative two. So when you're allowed to use your calculator on the quiz, I would highly, highly advise doing the problem with your calculator first and then start working it out and see if you get that same answer. Or if you want, do it by hand and then check on your calculator. It doesn't really matter the order. Any questions? All right, cool. Let's try the next one, which is going to be trickier. We're going further down the rabbit hole here which is with each of these problems. So it's the integral from 0 to 1 of x cubed over the square root of x to the fourth plus 9. I think, actually, with respect to x. Let me just check really quick. Yes. Okay. Okay, this one I'm going to give a little bit more time on. So we'll do, let's do three minutes. What, uh, what integration technique should we use for this? Anybody? Someone chime in, please. U sub. U sub. Okay. Now, how did you know that you should use U substitution? It doesn't have to be late. Yeah, go ahead, Leith. Uh, because when you take the derivative of x to the 4 plus 9, it'll be x cubed. And you know you can okay. substitute it out. Boom. So your U right here, when you do the, the – so he said your U is x to the 4th plus 9. When you do this derivative, it shows up right here. Well, part of it does, the x to the 3rd. Okay, this x to the third dx is equal to du over 4, so I'm going to substitute that in over here. And then it's 1 over the square root of u, so that's going to be u to the negative 1 power. Okay. Here's a little shortcut for you, too. I highly advise doing this. Plug in 0. Now, this 0 is in terms of x, but we're in terms of u now. So what you can do is take this 0 and plug it in because it's x. Plug it in here and it'll be in terms of u. So it's going to be 0 plus 9. This turns into 9. 
Okay, you can do the same thing with the one. Plug it in over here, you get one to the fourth plus nine is 10. So now you don't have to go back to X. Usually you have to substitute your X back in, but you can just keep everything in terms of U, which is gonna be a way easier set of numbers to work with here. So I'm gonna pull the one fourth out. You got about 10 seconds. All right, I pulled the one fourth out. For this right here, you have to add one to the power. Then you have to divide by that power. And then we're still gonna integrate it from nine to 10. This all simplifies to be, this is one half on the bottom. So it's the same thing. Dividing by one half is the same as multiplying by two. Multiply by the reciprocal, I'm gonna put that up here. And then you have u to the one half. And we're integrating this from nine to 10. Again, you do not need to substitute the u back in to be in terms of x, we can just stay here. So you're gonna end up with one half. And then it's 10 to the one half power minus nine to the one half power is three. And you get your final answer there. If you prefer square root signs instead of to the one half power, by all means, go crazy. doesn't matter. It only matters if you have a professor that's really, that cares about that stuff, but it's easier just to do one half power in my opinion. Well, for programming anyway. Cool, let's go to the calculator. So we're gonna do math nine from zero to one. Okay, we do have a fraction. So here's a little tip, zero. Come on, Lathe, are you gonna help me out or what? I'm not bad. <laughs> what do I pay you for? <laughs> I'm just I do not pay him. You pay me one cent per hour. <laughs> there you go. There we go, now we're cooking with gas here. The, oops, geez, the X, hopefully you guys did it right. There we go, okay. Now you should be able to test this. Obviously this, is, no, this does not help you at all, but if you could test it, <clears throat> with doing the one half times 10 to the one half minus three, and it equals the same thing. So you know you did it right. All right, the other two questions, the other two problems I'm gonna save for later if there's extra time and people wanna do them. It's, uh, here's a little hint. For this one, you need integration by parts. Still another definite integral problem. And then this last one, you need to do integration using, using partial fractions. Okay, but I will save those for later because the other stuff we're gonna go over is complicated and I wanna make sure everyone's brain is still fresh for those. Now, make sure you know how to do all of these because you, sometimes you'll have an improper integral that involves integration by parts or integration using partial fractions. You have to know everything. Everything in this class, everything in every math class snowballs. It all builds up over and over and over again. So make sure you understand the stuff from before. If you were like, cool, I got through week one, I barely passed, but we're on to new stuff. You still have to know the stuff from week one for week two, unfortunately. Okay, so what we can do C and D later but I now want to start with improper integrals. In this case, if I had this equation, y equals e to the negative x over two, what is the area in the first quadrant? Okay, I don't actually give you an integral on this, so we need to create an integral. The area in quadrant one is gonna be equal to, okay, we're gonna start at zero because quadrant one starts at zero um, for x, and then it goes forever this way. So we are integrating from zero to infinity for this. So it's gonna be something like this. Now, technically speaking, you cannot have an integral with an infinity up here. Don't ask me why. I did not make up the notation. Math's a language, certain symbols mean certain things. You can't have certain things in certain places. So you would have to rewrite this to be like this. Oops, I'm just gonna square that for some reason. So you have something like this. Same rules apply. Um, this limit, I'm just gonna 
write this out here. Same rules apply though. When you do the antiderivative, you have to do the antiderivative first, plug in B, plug in zero. So that's what I'm going to do. The antiderivative for this, e to the x is it, the derivative is itself. So I'm just going to rewrite itself like that. And then you have to divide because there's an inner function up here. You have to divide by that. When it's, when it's linear like that, you can just divide by the, whatever the derivative is. If you don't understand how I got this negative one half, just do the derivative of this and you'll, you'll see that you get back up to here. If you want, you could also do u substitution, but it takes a while, so I would not do u substitution. Okay. And we are integrating this from zero to b. b is going to infinity. I should ask first, does anybody think this is going to be an infinite area? Because it goes forever, but it's never actually approaching it. Does anybody think that? Yeah. Who said yeah? Lathe? Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? This is not intuitive. Like you can't possibly know this. And and I already know that if you think you know it, I'm already going to trick you on the next problem we're going to do too. So none of this is intuitive. I mean, it's not like looking at it and go, oh, that makes sense. You have to actually like break down this math like we're doing. So let's just keep doing that. So one person says yes, and then everyone else said nothing. Wait, I have a question. Go. Uh, why are we taking the limit again? I'm, I'm very confused on the limit thing. We, wouldn't it be the same if you just made B infinity? The, uh, whoever made this, I think it was um, Leib, Leibniz, 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 that's how you say it. Leibniz, he's one of the fathers of calculus. He just, he just made it as a rule that you can't have infinity up there. Like there's no, there's no reason. Like it's a human decided that it's not like the universe said that's impossible to do. It's kind of like why you have to capitalize the first letter of a sentence. Like math's a language, just like English is there's certain rules. That's what you have to apply. Am I going to care if you do it or not? No, I don't care. You're, you're going to notice that I do it sometimes. Okay. You're going to notice books do it. Sometimes you're going to notice that internet videos do it. Sometimes it's just, it's a language thing. It's the syntax. If you want to think of it that way. Like a programming language has certain syntax. Like it's, this is just how it is. Yeah. I got you. Thank you. Yeah. I don't, it's yeah. It is what it is. It's just so everyone's speaking the same thing. Like everyone, I don't even know. It's, it doesn't, I feel like this says the exact same thing. So what's the point? If this was an infinity, it wouldn't change anything. I think part of it is when, when Leibniz first made limits, the only way you can get to infinity is using a limit. Cause there was no, no, there was no like notation for, for infinity. So you had to use like, you had to use the limit. I don't know. I, I'm just guessing it's not, it's not important. All right. So what I'm going to do here is this negative one half, since you're dividing by negative one half, I'm just going to multiply by negative two, just so it's easier math to do. All right. So you can plug B in here and you're going to end up with negative two E to the negative B over two. Okay. So that's plugging the B in and then you have to plug the zero in. When you plug the zero in, you're going to, so you have to subtract this negative two E to the zero. I'm not going to do negative zero divided by two because negative zero divided by two is zero. Okay. Is everyone still on board? I don't know why I ask when no one answers. This is, okay. I'm just going to assume E to the zero is one because anything to the zero power is one except for zero. But yeah, so that's one. All right, now we need to figure out this limit here. So to figure this out, I'm going to rewrite it. This is going to get crazy. So negative two divided by, I'm going to make that negative exponent positive so I can put it on the bottom. Okay. Plus two, because this negative becomes negative, negative becomes a positive. All right, from here, we are going to infinity. So you have e to the infinity over two. e to the infinity over two is just infinity. You can't actually write this down, but I'm gonna do it anyway because it, it's just illustrative. If you have negative two divided by infinity, where does this approach? Zero. Zero, okay. If you think about it, if you had negative two pizzas and you divided it by infinitely many people, you have zero. Okay, even if you had a billion pizzas and you divided it by infinitely many people, you get zero because infinity is always gonna win. Okay, so that means, hold on. That means this whole, whoops, this whole thing is zero. This whole limit right here is zero plus two, which means your area in that first quadrant 
is two, which means your area of something that goes infinitely forever to the right, never approaching zero, does eventually hit a limit and that limit is two. So if you could go to infinity, which we can't, it would be two. So if you're thinking that's impossible, if it goes forever, you're just adding more and more areas. It, it, that's true, but we're doing the math and the math makes it possible because infinity works in our brains. It obviously isn't real, but <laughs> if you know two, yes, two. What? I know, I know it's not intuitive. I'm awesome about it. Here, check this out. Let's do this. Let's do um, E to, oh, wait till you see the next thing, dude. That's nothing. Uh, so we're going to do zero here. Uh, if you want to see what this graph looks like, <clears throat> you notice if you zoom in enough, it's going to take a little bit. Give me a second. It does not reach it. Okay. You can't actually equal zero on this function. It's impossible. If you try to set this equal to zero and solved, it will not work. Why am I doing this? Zoom. Okay. There we go. Now <clears throat> B is going to two pi right now because that was the last problem. Okay. So we're looking at this thing right here. This supposedly is going to be getting closer and closer to two if I go to infinity. So let's do 10. Let's do 100. Whoa, it already... Okay, that wasn't exciting. That went to two right away. Okay, because it ran out of memory. Um, here, let's do this. So if you just do... This is, this is embarrassing here. Okay. Um, let's just do two here. If you change this you can see that it's getting infinitesimally closer and closer to two. We're looking at this right here, by the way. You notice it's getting infinitesimally closer to two. Eventually, it caps out so early at 51. Wow. But that's just because it's exponential. Exponential grows really quickly. But anyway, you can see it goes to two, even though it technically goes forever. And this can never equal zero. It will never happen. That's so weird. In case you care, in case anyone's like wondering why does it not equal zero, here, let me show you. So if you did e to the negative x over two is equal to zero, think about it this way. Some power, this is 2.71828, eight, eight, whatever. Let's just say it's three. Three to some power could never be zero. Like what power could you raise this to to get zero? If you raise it to negative infinity, it would, but negative infinity is not a real number, right? So that's why this could never be equal to zero. It's approaching it forever. But if you have an exponential and it's positive, it can never, well, it has to be positive if it's exponential. It'll never reach zero. Long story short, you have a horizontal asymptote there. But that's crazy. That is crazy. Okay, this is going to be a huge deep dive with vertical asymptotes this time. If you look at your fake final, damn problem right here. Looks like we got some U sub or something in there. Uh oh. We're going to infinity. It's improper. So you should make sure you know how to do a problem like this. All right, let's go over this one. One over x to the p. Okay, p, let's just say p is greater than zero. Now the reason I'm saying p is greater than zero is because if it wasn't, that means it'd be negative. And if this is negative, like say it was x to the negative, one over x to the negative one, that's just equal to x. Okay, if you have one, if you have, um, zero to one for the area of X, it's, that's very easy. I'm, I'm actually trying to do something that involves asymptotes and this does not have an asymptote. So P is gonna be greater than zero for these problems that I'm about to do. It could be other values for different things, but for this example, it's gonna be greater than zero. Okay, what I wanna do is figure out what this integral is if P is greater than zero. This is very abstract. We're gonna be staying in P. We're not gonna be putting a number in for P right away anyway. And it, this is just insane. So that's kind of why I wanna do it. Okay, ignore this graph for right now. It's going to make sense in a little bit. So let's just go down here and we'll go back up eventually. Try to write this down, pay attention, ask questions. I'm going too fast. So I'm going to go, whoa, whoa, whoa. What did you do there? You went too fast. Okay. <clears throat> let's do this first. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Does anybody notice an ex a problem with this integral right now as it's, as it's looking from zero to one? saying what's the area from zero to one under one over X to the P if P is greater than zero. Why is that a problem? Because you can't know? take derivative of two, vari two uh, variables. Um, okay, you, you're right about that, but just act like P is three then. So you are right, but what else? Anything with that zero seem a little bit weird? Someone has to know this. If we're doing the area from zero to one, can you put zero into this formula? 
Oh, yeah, because you can't because it's going to be one over zero. Exactly. You'd be divided by zero. One is being divided by zero and you can't do that. Thank you, Matthew, for writing that in there. Yes, very good. So what we are going to do is we're going to get infinitesimally closer to zero, but not actually being equal to zero. Okay. And to do that, you're going to need one sided limits. What side do we want? The left side or the right side for this? We're going from zero to one. Right side, of course. Right side. So this is going to be a plus. Okay. And we're integrating this from A to one. Now, if you wrote zero plus here, I've never actually seen that. I've never, I've seen infinity in there, but I've never actually seen a zero with a little positive sign up there before. So that's, that's another thing where they, where they always use limits. Okay. So we end up with something like this. All right. Um, let's see here. All right. Let's keep going with this. Now we do reach a dead end because if you wanted, eh, let's just, let's just keep going with it. Forget the dead end. It, technically we did hit a dead end, but someone will call me on it later. I'm sure, which is good. All right. So this is technically equal to here. Let's not put an equal sign there. This is technically equal to X to the negative P. Okay. So if we we're going to do the antiderivative of that, what would it be? Well, you would add one to the power and then you would divide by that same power. I'm going to put the one in front. I should have flip flopped that. I don't like the way it looks, but that's okay. And we're still going from a to one. Okay, so I just did reverse power rule. I figured someone would call me on this because I said P is greater than zero. So if P is greater than zero, what if P was equal to one? Would we be able to do reverse power rule if P was equal to one? No. No, because it would be ln x. So I figured, but we're going to get to that a little bit. So just bear with me on this. And actually, this is, this is so cool. All right. Let's, uh, let's follow our definite integral rules on this. So what we're going to do is we're going to plug in one and we're going to plug in a, and we're going to subtract those two values. So first thing we're going to do is plug in one for X. So you're going to end up with one to the one minus P power over one minus P. Okay. Minus, now you have to plug a in parentheses here. You plug a in for X and you're going to, end up with this. Something like that. Okay. Hopefully everyone's still on board. Now, if A is going to zero, what is this whole value going to be equal to here? Zero. Zero. So you technically don't need this limit anymore now because there is no more A's in this problem if this is zero. And you end up with one over one minus P. But if you remember from before, this is where it gets crazy. P is greater than zero. And I said before, well, if P was equal to one, you would have to have ln X. Could P equal one for this purple equation here? This purple expression? No, because no. you'd be dividing by zero, right? So this works, this equation works right here is if, if P is greater than zero, but P not be equal to one. Okay. But this is, there's another, there's another but on this. There's so many, there's so many issues with this. It's awesome. What if this is crazy. Here we go. What if P was equal to two? So then you're going to have one over one minus two, which is equal to negative one. Why is this not right? How can, why is negative one not right for the area from zero to one of one over X squared? Because it's not a negative area. It's not negative. Okay. If you graphed one over X squared, which I believe the one over X squared here in this case is the, the red. It's, it's clearly a positive area from zero to one. Okay. Here's one right here. The area would be this thing right here. That's clearly positive. So 
this does not work or anything that's p is greater than one so it has to be less than one so long story short this will only work if p is whoops between zero and one so then what happens if p is equal to two well let's let's try to solve that one out by the way um what i have graphed up here it's kind of a spoiler, but what I have graphed up here, this green one is one over is when P is equal to here. Let's, let's color code this P is equal to one half for this, for that, that one, the red one, P is equal to two and the blue one, P is equal to one. Okay. So what we're going to do, if you notice, they all from zero to one, they all have a vertical asymptote at zero. You can't divide by zero, but we're trying to figure out this area from one Try to figure out what's that? Hey, can you backtrack real quick? How did you yeah, get the purple yeah. again at the end? One over one minus p wouldn't it be one to the one minus p over one minus p. Well, what's one to any power, kebab? Oh, uh, just and remember, and remember, p is greater than zero. Yeah. So, so p is so say p was one or p was three or p was a million. One minus a million. If you do one to the negative a million power, it's still going to be one. Sorry, okay. I kind of sidestep that real quick yeah one to any power is one okay this is insane yeah. okay now let's do one where p is equal to two and just see what happens okay this is this should be this should be very very easy problem to do so now if p is equal to two you're gonna have x to the negative two from zero to one dx okay from here you're going to have negative x to the negative one, and we're integrating that from zero to one. You can't plug zero in here. So we're going to turn this into an a, and then it's the limit as a approaches zero from the right. Okay. So you plug negative, you plug one in there, you end up with negative one. Okay, you plug a in there. Now a needs the limit, so I'm going to write the limit in here. A approaches zero, and you're going to end up with uh, negative a to the negative one. Oops, simplify that a little bit. Negative one plus the limit as a approaches zero from the right of one over a. Does anybody know that limit? You should know that from Calc one. What's the answer for that limit? this limit right here in blue. Is it zero? You have one pizza and you're dividing it by some tiny, actually forget the pizza because it doesn't make, make sense, but you're taking one and you're dividing it by a very, 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 very small number. Oh, infinite. Infinite, infinity. Okay, you should know that again from the previous class. Well, infinity minus one is still infinity. So if you change P is equal to two for this up here. P is equal to two. The area approaches infinity for one half. Whoops, I should do this in green. For one half, it should be one over one minus P. P is one half, so it's one over one half. So it's two. So if P is one half, the green, it comes out to a value. If it's, I shouldn't, should have done that in red. If it's two, the area is approaching infinity. Why would it pick one to be that way versus the other? Why is two any different than one half? Huh, weird. What's gonna happen with one then? Anybody know? Of course not, let's do it between two and infinity so it'd be a large number or some sort of number well no uh, the, the blue it's not between two and infinity because oh i see what you're doing because yeah i can't okay i thought you meant from the graph gotcha all right well let's do it it's not going to take very long so we have one over x because p is equal to one for this one so now we have ln oops Actually, you don't need the absolute values, but I'll have some value bars, but I'll do it anyway, from zero to one. Okay, ln of one is zero. So you're gonna have ln of one 
minus ln of zero. You can't do ln of zero, but you can get infinitesimally closer to that. You might need your calculator for that one. Don't need the absolute value bars. But anyway, this ends up being zero. This, if you graph it, No, I'm going to do that. All right, let's do that. So if you graph this, um, let's see here. F of X equal to LN of X. Oops. You notice as you get closer to zero from the right, it goes down to negative infinity. Now, it's never actually reaching it if you zoom in enough. This is going to take forever. Oh, no. I think I scrolled down too far. I'm not giving up yet. There it is. Whew. It took forever. Okay, it's still not reaching it, but it's going down forever as you approach it from the right. So that's negative infinity, long story short. So you're subtracting off negative infinity. That's embarrassing. There we go. Subtracting off negative infinity, which is equal to infinity. Okay, so let's go back up here. P was equal to one, the area goes to infinity. P is equal to two, the area goes to infinity. But if P is equal to one half, it's two, even though all the graphs, all three of the graphs are approaching the Y axis the exact same way. It's a vertical asymptote the exact same way. Why is this happening? We will go over this in unit six, actually, in great detail of why this is happening. It's actually, it's not intuitive at all, but it's still, still pretty interesting. Um, Okay, long story short, that's what you do for when there is a vertical asymptote. I just thought it was cool to show it with different uh, 1 over x's. Some people assume that it's infinity because it goes forever. It really depends on the, the function. All right, so let's go here. Okay, so that's basically all of 4, 3, 4. Okay, improper integrals, vertical asymptote, horizontal asymptote, interesting things happen. Let's go to area of a polar region. These right here are basically just... Uh, this right here is, we're going to need this later on, but it's uh, trig identities that you probably long forgotten from, excuse me, from pre-calc. So that's what that is. This is the area formula that we're going to use. This is that, that animation, or not animation, that graphic I showed you before. This is a formula we're going to need, though. All right, let's do, let's see here. I want to pick a certain problem. Ooh, this is a good one. Okay. I want to figure out the area... Zoom in here. I want to figure out the area of this polar curve right here. I want to figure out the area from 0 to 2 pi. Okay. So before we do this, I want to look at a graphic of this, just a graph to see what it looks like. And let's make sense of it. Okay. So we are going to go actually... Let's do it on our actual calculators because Desmos doesn't really do polar graphs very well. Okay. Go to your calculator, change it to polar, y equals, and we're going to do 2 times 1 plus, I think it was cosine, theta. Okay, zoom, 6, that doesn't matter. You end up with some graph that looks like this. Okay. Now imagine finding the area of this. To find the area of this, essentially what we're doing here, let me screenshot this. Essentially what we would be doing, so pixelated, is finding, let's see, if we're going from zero, zero is going to be four, so it starts here. It doesn't matter. Um, imagine making slices of pizza. This is so, I'm sorry, the lines are not straight at all. Completely around and adding up all these slices, but imagine these slices are infinitely thin. So that one's too thick. These are all have to be infinitely thinner and you're going all the way around. I hope you get the idea because this is so annoying. Oh man, I think a brain. <laughs> so I just went over the exact same one. All right, so you're adding up every single one of those when you use this equation up here. 
Okay. And if you're adding up every single one of those, then you essentially found the area of the entire thing. Long story short. Okay. So let's do it. So here we go. First thing I'm going to do is the equation, you need R squared. So right away, I always just find R squared because otherwise you have to rewrite a bunch of stuff. It'll make more sense as we go. Let's just find R squared first. And I would also expand this out as much as humanly possible because it makes the integral easier. So that's what I'm going to do. Four times one plus two cosine theta plus cosine squared theta. There we go. Is there any questions on how I got this? This is all algebra. You've done no calculus yet. Okay, anytime you have a squared, you wanna get rid of it. Okay, the reason why is you can't take the antiderivative when it's cosine squared. That's why I have this right here, these two equations. Okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna replace that cosine squared with this thing right here. If you wanna know where this comes from, I would Google it. It's very, very involved proof. You probably, you've seen it before because it was in pre-calc, but it's such a long time ago. It's not worth it. You don't need to know where the proof comes from, but we do need to use it. Okay, so I'm gonna rewrite this. Oops, just distribute this. I don't know what I'm doing. Four plus eight cosine theta plus four times cosine two theta plus one over two. I will give you these two formulas too because what's the point? You can just write them in your calculator and memorize them that way. So I just rather give them to you. Okay, we're gonna simplify this again as much as humanly possible. Okay, now we are ready to do the integral. We're gonna use this formula right here. From alpha to beta, that's zero to two pi. Here we go. So we're going to do the integral from 0 to 2 pi of 1 half times this whole mess right here. So 4 plus 8 cosine theta plus 2 cosine 2 theta plus 2 d theta. So everyone's still on board. Oh man, okay. Okay, I'm gonna simplify some things here. This and this becomes six. Okay, which is equal to zero to theta. Okay, now I'm gonna distribute everything out here so you're gonna end up with three plus four cosine theta plus cosine two theta. All of this is with respect to theta, and I wrote x for some reason. Oh. Okay, now we need to take the antiderivative of this, hence the reason why we reviewed it from before. You're gonna be you're gonna end up with three theta plus four sine theta plus sine two theta, divide by that inner derivative for two, and then we're going from zero to two pi. Now try not to get intimidated by this, it's actually not that bad. If you plug in two pi here to that, it's gone. If you plug it into here, you get four pi, which is zero still. So sine of two pi, zero. Sine of four pi, it's still zero. If you plug zero in, you get zero here and zero here and actually zero here. So you end up with, if you plug two pi in, you're gonna get three times two pi minus zero times three, which ends up being six pi. Questions on that? All right, I'm gonna show you how to do this on your calculator now. Pay attention, here we go. So we're gonna do uh, math nine again. We're going from zero to two pi 
of two times one plus cosine theta squared theta, and you get some crazy number. But guess what happens if you divide this by pi? You get six, so it's six pi, just like we got here. And that's basically today's lesson. <laughs> if you want to stick around and do the practice final with me, the two problems that are on the practice final, by all means. Otherwise, I will see you if you unless you set up an office hours time with me tomorrow. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you on Monday for the uh, for the quiz. Quiz is going to be two problems. It's going to be an improper integral problem and a area of the polar region problem. Questions? Is anyone going to stick around? Uh, I'm going to. Can you hear me? What's that? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. You're going to stick oh, around? You want to do practice yeah, problems? I'll, I'll stick around. I'll stick around. All right, cool. Stick. All right, awesome. All right, let me save this. Okay, let's start with number six. Kind of gave this away already, but um, what integration technique are we going to use? Isn't it by parts? Try it by parts. I don't think it's going to work, but try it. No, it won't work. It won't work because think about it. This is going to be your U. If that's your V, I mean, I'm sorry. If this is your DV, what's your V? You can't do that antiderivative. It's impossible. Yeah. Yeah. So it's you need U substitution. Well, we'll try working it out. First person that gets the answer, let me know. I don't want to step on your toes. Oh, man. Oh, excuse me. Well, a good amount of people are still here, actually. That's good. All right. How are we doing? Does anybody need help? Something to the infinity is just infinity, right? What is the something? E. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to graph this really quick just to see what it looks like. Hopefully people wrote it down already. I graph it on Desmos because it's better. Here. XE to the negative X whoops squared. Wait a moment, look at this thing. Okay. And B on B's at the 127. Did I write that correctly? Huh. 
<laughs> Can I give away the answer? But that's okay. Oh wait, this isn't the answer because it said one. There we go. Holy cow, look at that thing. Sweet. Sweet. <laughs> Oh, jeez. Does anybody have an answer? It's just infinity, right? Or mm, what's e to the negative infinity? Oh. Wait, how'd you get it to be negative infinity? Isn't it infinite positive? Remember, you can change the u's. Or I'm sorry, the x values to be in terms of u. Do you have to do that. I would. Yeah, this is all in terms of u, so these have to be in terms of u. Plug negative. Plug one in here, you get one squared negative negative one. Plug infinity in here, you get negative infinity squared, which is negative infinity. Gotcha. Yeah. Tricky. But only if you get tricked. Definitely stick around. I'm going to show you how to do this on your calculator as well. It's not going to give you the exact value, but you could, t you could test if your exact value is correct or not. It's so odd how they have you do the notation with the limit instead of just putting it up there. Oh, I know. You have to rewrite it every million, like every time. It's so stupid. Does it come in handy later, like in a different, like later cal? <laughs> I don't think so. Honestly, I really, I really don't think so. I can't remember if it did. I haven't seen Calc three in like nineteen years. So, no, it is, it is very annoying. If you do not do it, I will not uh, get upset. <laughs> okay. So, although I shouldn't say that because I am being recorded, but 
I don't think they're gonna ever watch any of these the college, but all right. <clears throat> I'm gonna show you how to do this on a calculator really quick. So first thing I'm gonna do is go back to the function regular. All right, and then I'm gonna go math nine. Now we are going from one to infinity. I'm just gonna put a hundred in there for now. Okay, just because I want to. Um, I'll do a thousand next, but we're just gonna look for that trend. X, so negative X squared up here with respect to X. Okay. It's gonna take, oh, it didn't take as long as I thought. Okay, and then I'm gonna hit second entry and then I'm gonna change that 100 to 1,000. Because remember, we're going to infinity, so I'm just going to see a trend. Oops, zero, zero, hit enter. Oh, darn it. I, that definitely is not right. I think this overloaded it, darn it. That's not good. Anyway, if you do one divided by two E, you end up with that first value, which is the right answer. I think this just overloaded. Anything with exponential usually overloads it, especially since you're squaring the what your exponent is. So it gets really huge and it just starts truncating values because of the memory getting overloaded. It's, imagine it this way. This is a terrible analogy, but I kind of love it for some reason. But like you can count with your fingers, but you only have 10, so you'd run out. Imagine like a computer is basically running out of fingers to count with. That's what essentially happened here. This is this is the right answer. Because I I tested it on Desmos. It's the only reason I know that. Here, let me right here on Desmos, I went to 127. But if you you notice right here, it's just gonna Desmos doesn't overload as fast as your calculator does. So I can put in what is this, a million, 10 million, 10 million. But it ends up being that one over two e. So this is actually how your calculator calculates things. It does it to a million trillion whatever, and then it stops. So, any questions on that? I don't know how to like protect against that happening. Oh yes, I do. I just thought of something. Cool. All right. So this is what we're gonna do. Instead of starting at a hundred, let's start at let's start at ten. Don't start at one because going from one to one is just going to be zero. Obviously, oh man. Okay, hold on. Delete. Delete. Okay, so one to ten. Always start at ten. That's the rule of thumb. Okay, if you start at ten, now go to a hundred. If the number stays the same, don't go any higher. See, then you know it's kind of, it's probably the value. Okay, so it stayed the exact same. So one over two e. Do five hundred. Without all right. It. Why don't you relax a little bit, man? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, dude. Um, whatever you want, do five hundred. Maybe maybe it won't overload it, but. I don't know. I just like foolproof ways of doing things. I mean, you late, we've talked about that before. Like I got a, I got a perfect score on the ACT because I checked every one of my problems with the calculator. So I made sure that everything was 100% correct because the calculator is basically your answer key. You know, I, I can think of a couple examples where it's not, but for the most part, you can use your calculator to check all your work. It's perfect. And it's not cheating. Mm-hmm. All right, how are we doing? Are we good with this problem? Can we go to the next one? Yeah, let's, let's go. All right, cool. All right, the first one right here, this, this Limason, we're not going to do that one. We're going to do the second one here. Okay, the reason why is because it's more like indicative. It's, it's a harder problem. So this other one was kind of like the same problem we just did. And I want to do something different. I know in trig, we, we used to like memorize the names yeah, of every that's garbage. Shape. I'm sorry, that's not garbage. I think it's garbage to memorize shapes of graphs when your calculator can do it. I, I know what you can. Yeah. <laughs> Limason. It's an S, right? But, uh, okay, so we're going to not do this first one, but we will do this, this second one here. Okay? 
Now, you really, really want to use your calculator on this one unless you memorize, like he was just talking about, um, what the shape of this is. It says it's a rose, but you still have to know where it uh, intersects, the, intersects the graph, which I would not worry about it. Let's just graph it. Forget all this nonsense. This will help you greatly. So we're doing polar. Make sure the window goes from zero to two pi. So this needs to be two pi here. It already is. I'm just writing it in there again for fun. Okay. Always go the full unit circle. It's just better. And let's put sine of three theta in there. And then we're going to graph it. And if you notice, it's three petal rows like it says. I'm going to actually zoom in though. I think zoom trig zooms in. Nope. Let's just do zoom in then. Zoom in. Ooh, look at that. It's amazing. All right. So all these petals are actually the same. I don't know why it looks like that. I think because my zoom settings are all weird. That's the baby. <laughs> he needs to relax. Jeez. All right, going back to the graph. Um, we just need to figure out the area of one of these. So in order to do that, what we can do is find the area of all of them and then just divide by three. That's the easiest way to do it. And normally you'd have to memorize this, but what you can do is just go through the graph. So it starts there and make sure it goes around all three before you get the, to pi to two pi. Also, oh, only finding one area for the. Oh shoot! Actually, hold on. Let's not do it that way. I just realized it goes. It only goes to pi, not two pi. Yeah, because so you said why you have to graph it to figure it out. Okay, like the three, the three ends. At, oh no, it doesn't at two pi. I was lie lied. This one just said, hold on, give me one second. So there's zero, and it's drawing the. You just want to make sure you don't overlap for polar. Okay. It goes, it goes all the way around from here all the way to here. And I believe that's pi over six. Here, let's check it out. So I'm trying to figure out a way of getting it so people do not have to memorize all this. It's not pi over six. That makes no sense. It's pi over three. Okay. So we're going to go from zero to pi over three for one of these. We don't need to go, worry about going to zero to two pi. So we're just going from here from one pedal to pi over three. So if you, if you notice, that's kind of how it works here. Zero, so from zero, and then you just press left, or I'm sorry, right, and go all my directions. And you want to go the entire way of that first pedal, and it goes to this right here, which is pi over three. If you wanted, you can just keep going all the way around, and it goes to pi. So you can go to pi and then divide by three. It doesn't really matter. Okay, whatever you want to do. Maybe maybe pi divided by three is easier. It doesn't matter. Either way, let's set up this area. So we have the area going from zero to pi over three of sine. Oops, embarrassing. Got the one half. One half sine squared three theta d theta. Okay. Now, you can't do this antiderivative, so we're going to use this thing right here. Oops, oh, that's embarrassing. Um, hold on, I was at the wrong layer on this. Ah, I didn't want to do that. There it is. Okay, cool. Cool, cool. Let's do this. All right. So first thing we're going to do is replace this sine squared with this right here. So it's going to be the area is equal to zero to pi over three of one half times cosine. Now it's going to be six theta because it's three theta in here. So if it's regular theta, you just multiply it by two, whatever's there. Minus one divided by negative two, drop down the d theta. Okay, the rest of it, you should be able to do 
zero issues. The area is equal to negative one fourth. I'm going to pull out the negative one fourth here. And then we're integrating it from zero to pi over three of cosine six theta minus one d theta. You should be able to do this antiderivative in your sleep. So it's going to be sine six theta over six minus theta. And we're integrating it from zero to pi over three. Okay, so you plug in the pi over three here, you end up with sine of two theta, two pi, I'm sorry, two, two pi, which is zero. So it's gonna be zero minus theta minus, let's do this. I have to plug in zero. Sine of zero is zero, so then minus another zero is just zero. And you're left with you're left with positive pi over twelve. Okay, use your calculator to test if this is right. Just throw this whole thing in your cal. Whoops, throw this whole thing in your calculator right here. See if you get the same thing. So math nine zero it's pi over three whoops point five sine it works it's a miracle and that's the answer how are we doing Uh, that was fine for me. All right, and then are we are we cool with um, these problems? Are, I mean, these aren't these shouldn't be too difficult. Um, like, I mean, they're, they're not easy, but like you're, these are going to be on your quiz. They're going to be on your test. I just want to make sure everything's fair. Do we have to know like the coordinates, like from zero to pi three to pi over three, like by looking at um, the calculator? Normally, you would have to memorize those, um, but again, you can just use your calculator to find that. Okay. Yeah, this one was a little harder because it says one pedal. So you have to know, like the other one said zero to two pi, so it was kind of easy for you. So if it said three pedals, you just times it by three, right? Yeah, if it was if it was all three pedals, yeah. Or you could just go to pi and it would be pi over four. Yeah, if you if you just if you if you integrated from zero to pi instead of zero to pi over three, it would do all three of them for you. Oh, okay. yeah. 